Okay, we'll get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is like part two of the sessions on left ventricular function. Uh, a few months ago, we did part one, which was global function. And today, we're going to talk more about regional function, or regional wall motion. Um, how do we look at that at rest? And of course, uh, with stress, which has become a very popular way of assessing coronary artery disease. So as we had said earlier, um, we use echoes a lot to assess ventricular function, both global and regional. And <clears throat> for decades now, from the early days of 2D echo, it was agreed upon that uh, wall motion would be assessed in a way similar to left ventricular and geography. So this these terms are very old terms, i.e. A, a segment of the ventricle is either contracting normally, it's hypokinetic, akinetic, which basically implies no contraction at all, or dyskinetic, which means it's actually moving away during systole, or frankly aneurysmal, which denotes a diastolic geometric distortion. So this kinesis is not aneurysm. To have an aneurysm, you have to have a diastolic distortion of geometry at the apex, at the inferior wall, etc. So these terms have been very, very established in the literature from the days of left ventricular angiography. Nuclear cardiology applied them, uh, echo applied them, and today also with CT and, 2D and uh, CMR. So when we're looking at uh, regional wall motion um, by echo, we are looking at two things. Our eyes tend to look at overall movement of the endocardium. For example, here, you can see that there is some movement. Um, there's some movement here. But importantly, the amount of thickening. You can see that this area thickens a lot better and moves better than this area here. Here, we even have probably no movement at all. So hopefully you all can see that this patient has abnormalities in the inferolateral, inferior and inferolateral regions, as uh, the arrows point. And again, by convention, for many years, uh, the segments were divided the way you see them in this slide. For many decades, the um, the distal apical portion was not separated from the distal segment. So all of this was called the apex. And the model consisted of 16 segments. Uh, but more recently then, when groups from multiple modalities put together um, an agreement, it was agreed upon that the tip of the apex should be separated because sometimes that's the only area that appears abnormal. So that went from 16 to 17 segments. And what you see here is a typical distinction of segments with coronary vessels with the RCA and the circumflex sharing territories depending on the dominance in that particular patient. So again, hopefully this is something that is very well known by all of you because it's applied to any imaging modality including um, angiography. And again, this is the way that a wall motion score is applied, is by giving one to normal, two to hypo, three AK, four and five, and then you add all these segments and divide by the total number of segments, which used to be 16, but now it is 17. So we go back to this patient that we took before. Uh, we would call this area here two because it's still thickening a little bit, where these e here are three because um, they really don't thicken at all. In fact, you even see a brightness and a little bit of dyskinesis there. So you put all this together and you get with uh, to a score of 24 divided by 17 or 1.4. So that's the way the wall motion score works. It's something very, very helpful. And as you know, all of our reports will calculate one because there's been multiple studies showing that wall motion score index by itself is a good predictor of prognosis. EF is a predictor of prognosis. The score also is a predictor of 
of prognosis or event rates. Now, today we have, of course, this, which we love, right? Strain, strain imaging. And as we showed a couple of months ago when we were talking about global, um, we can see multiple segments. It, we are spending more time clinically today with the longitudinal strain. Uh, we can also do radial and circumferential. But longitudinal strain has sort of picked up more because uh, it seems to have more applications in bread and butter clinical medicine, and also it's easier. Uh, apical images tend to be a little easier sometimes to manipulate than parasternal. But we should not eliminate the fact that actually circumferential and radial uh, can be also very helpful. So this is a normal, normal case. You see everything is symmetric. All the curves are moving relatively in the same direction. Whereas this is a global heart. This heart is a cardiomyopathy probably. You know, it's very, very bad EF. But now with the strain, we can see that even when you have global dysfunction, you still have some areas that uh, will be hypokinetic, some more than others, and even areas that are achy or slightly dyskinetic. So within a ventricle that most likely has a non-ischemic myopathy, you see we strain a fair amount of regional uh, abnormalities. And therefore, it's no surprise that this will be very sensitive but less specific for coronary artery disease. Because chances are very good this patient gets calf and he may have clean coronaries. So we have now developed a very sensitive tool, uh, which is good, but that will have some problems for specificity. Nevertheless, studies have been done showing that you can detect regional abnormalities in patients with coronary artery disease. This is taken from one of the early publications by Perk uh, in Jace in 2007. And these are very typical bullseyes that you will see uh, when patients have uh, LAD lesions. So you will see the anterior distribution towards the apex. People with RCAs and people with circumflex lesions where you see the appropriate areas that you would expect having diminished systolic strain. So this bullseye, of course, should not surprise us at all. Now, there's another type of strain imaging, which is the vector velocity image imaging, which I think is, the, is what the Siemens system has. Uh, there's a couple of advantages. One is that you can do post-processing. In other words, you can do a, an echo, and then you can actually post-process this for that, where in the previous one, you have to acquire it at the time. The second one is that you get these little vectors, which at the beginning, you go like, eh, so what? You know, it's pretty, but what does it do? Well, the next slide shows possible application. This is a guy that has an epical infarct. The 2D echo would show it nicely. The image quality is not that great. And yet, with the vectors, you can very nicely see that these areas are very abnormal. When these areas are contracting with a vector moving into the cavity, at the same time, the vector here is moving outside. It's, it's the opposite way. So it may have uh, potential benefits to my knowledge. I may be missing it. But I have not seen any study where the same patients in a large series have been done with both systems, having some sort of independent standard, like coronary angiography, ischemic, something, to see whether this technology might be a little better or worse than the one that we use with either GE or with uh, Philips. I think it will be an interesting study, but I don't think we have knowledge, factual knowledge of that. So let me show you some cases. Dr. Pasha, I think you probably will get this correct. A, do you see any regional abnormalities? And B, where do you see them? Well, probably on the two chamber view of the uh, basal inferior wall. There. And I would agree. And uh, hopefully everybody here agrees. Is there anyone here that does not see uh, this? 
Would you call that hypo, echi, dischi? Yeah, I would say either civili hypo or maybe even echi. That's right. Is it an aneurysm? I don't think so. Now, any other areas? Do you see anything else? Does your eye pick up anything else? Uh, could we bring the lights down a little bit? Is this an all or none, or do we have room for dimming a little bit? Because it might make it easier. Yeah. Do you see anything else? We all agree. There's an RCA issue here. Do you see anything else? And I'm not testing you. It's just, you know, ARB, you know, yeah, yeah or no? Yeah, based on the receptor, I don't see the border very well, but I would probably would have covered. Yeah, actually, on purpose, this is a, f uh, this here is a four chamber. I can, I'll use here this so that it'll be easier for the oldest people. This is a four chamber. This is an in between. There's a little bit of RV left. This is an in between four and two on purpose so that you could all see the inferior septum. So if you really want to see inferior septum, sometimes you see it here. But if you really want to see it well, you want to do, and this is for the sonographers, you want to rotate slowly from four to two. Because as you lose the RV, you are getting the inferior septum, and you're correct. The inferior septum is also affected. Anything else? Do you see anything in this inferolateral wall? I don't. I agree. All right. So here comes the strain. Not bad. We have a, a pretty good concordance, right? We have here now um, inferior septum, inferior wall, but now we're catching a little bit of that inferolateral, making us kind of look again, well, gee, maybe there was something there. OK? No surprise. We c the, 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 uh, the bottom line is the same, you know? Very sensitive. It picks up a little more than the eye will pick up, or a lot more sometimes. All right, this other one. Anybody agrees? Anybody thinks this is a normal ventricle? Anyone says yes, there may be a beautiful grand rounds for urology going on in the <laughs> second floor. OK, so this is a bad ventricle. It's a great image. Not, nobody can complain about quality. So we have a low EF. Question is, do we have regional abnormalities, or is this just global? Well, what do you think? Anybody? Misha, what do you think? Is this global or regional? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, nothing is beating the band, but you're right. You know, you have areas like maybe these areas here that are moving a little bit better, you know, uh, than perhaps some of these here. Do you see some areas that clearly looks worse? Like maybe a kinetic. Here, right? And maybe there, that's correct. What about the apex? Is the apex just, you know, hypo, or is it worse, or? Well, you know, if it's hypo, then it joins the club, right? Because there's a lot of hypo in other places. I mean, the septum motion is very dark. So if, if this patient had coronary disease, OK, we would say he has RCA with a cardiomyopathy, or would we say suspicious of multivessel disease? There's plenty of room to see it. Understand? You're not, you're not growing anymore. Um, so is this multi, you know, multivessel, or this is just a patient that has a, a cardiomyopathy plus an RCA disease? Well, where, where would be statistical odds here? Nothing is perfect, but you would vote more for? I want to go for cardiomyopathy. Really? Underlying OK. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you, and you might be right. Who knows? The, the septum motion is also suggestive of a bundle branch, branch <coughs> or, isn't it? Uh, maybe. Um, OK, so what does strain do? So here's strain. So clearly, the worst areas are in the RCA circ. No question about it. You have, um, oop. You have the, um, you have all of this, and this is much better. In fact, it's the best is minus 14. Uh, no, maybe minus 16. So even the best areas are not perfectly normal, right? So this goes for global, because even here, you, you have some level of hypo hypokinesis. 
but then you have a lot worse over here, okay? So either a very dominant right, a very dominant circ, could be. It could have been somebody to have a, but I would go for, our, for coronary disease, you know, whether there's a kind of on top of that or not, that's a little difficult to assess. All right, this one doesn't have exactly the best quality imaging, but it's not too bad either. What do you all think? And this is actually a recent study. In fact, I was reading yesterday. I think this is from yesterday or two days ago. So, um, you know, what do you all think? Anybody? Who wants to take a crack at it? Base of inferior. Base of inferior. So you're concerned with this here. Okay. What else? Here, maybe? Okay. Now, notice the beauty of short axis. Look at how this contracts compared to this. So I agree with you. I think clearly this looks a lot more uh, contractile than these areas here. So yes, in some hypokinesis, again, in that interlateral area. And again, this strain kind of agrees. So uh, we, you, so bad, not so bad, right? We've done uh, three out of three. Okay, not bad. This is a lot for the sonographers, so we encourage you all to you do more strain. Okay, now this one is from yesterday. This one is from yesterday. Do you see any one motion abnormalities? EF? Any? Huh? 35 over here? 40 is over there. Any, do I have any higher bits? Do I take any higher bits? <laughs> Cavity looks a little small. We worry about for shortening. However, look at this. Remember, if you remember my lecture from two months ago, the apex is pointing north. So we should not have too much for shortening because at least we are aligned nicely through the apex. Okay. So um, to my eyes, I would have said EF in the 50s. And, you know, I'm not sure that I would have said much about one motion normalities. I agree with you guys on that. This is a true story. The strain was then done. It showed that. So we have minus 21 here, in these areas here. We have uh, 14, 12, 13, 15. Then we start hitting the jackpot in this area here. After this train, more imaging was done. What do you think now? These pictures were done after this train in the sequence. So I'm assuming the sonographer saw that, I'm assuming, and very astute, said, whoops, maybe I should take a few more views. I don't know, maybe one of you will remember this case. If you do, raise your hand and get some credit. <laughs> so I think that this is a nice, nice case where actually, you know, in a way, if we had not done this, we'd have, we would have questioned perhaps the accuracy of this train, but then we went back and took a more careful look. Uh, contrast was not given. I'm assuming if contrast would have been given, it would have also shown very nicely. And of course, you saw this two months ago. This is just the ultimate. The ultimate in suprasensitivity of strain, which is when you have a ventricle like this, that is basically cavity obliteration with severe concentric LVH, and yet you get that. You get, and the image quality is, is beautiful. And you get, in fact, this patient was done with two machines. Uh, to, um, uh, Toshiba and the GE, and both show the same thing. Both show this. So this is the ultimate proof that this technology is so sensitive that it basically picks up what the eye doesn't see, which is good news <laughs> and bad news, right? It's the same story that we discussed uh, earlier. So limitation is, number one, it only works well with decent quality, although I show you that VVI picture that maybe the vector imaging might be a little bit more forgiving. That hypothesis has not been tested. You cannot use contrast, which is a pain. 
Because if you could use contrast and then apply strain, boy, that would be really cool. But this technology goes to hell <laughs> when you put the contrast. Um, you need to practice in how to acquire and process. Problem is, if you have bad data and your eye cannot validate it, and you totally believe this strain, you could possibly <coughs> then be making some errors in clinical decision. Um, there is some issues with normality between vendors. What is a normal value? Uh, there's still some issues with coming back and doing the same patient again and doing some reproducibility, although that is, I think, getting better. And the most important limitation is, what do we do when the eye doesn't see anything and the strain is abnormal? And we mentioned this two months ago when we're talking about global function. You will see the same story with regional dysfunction. What do you do when you see a regional abnormality and your eye doesn't catch it? And otherwise, nothing in the clinical history suggests anything. Do you report it? Do you keep it on the file and don't mention it? What do you do? And I don't have an answer for it because I don't think anybody does. So moving along the way, we have this 62-year-old fellow who comes with acute chest pain, OK? Uh, this shows two things. Number one, the beauty of contrast. Any reason why we turn the lights on again? People? Oh, OK. You need, you need it? All right, no problem. Um, shows the beauty of contrast. Uh, EF, it's down. I think we all would agree. Now, do you see any world motion anomalies? Yeah, the curve of and the period. So you see the, infi the uh, inferior wall, you mean? What, what, I'm sorry, what do you say? Inferior septum? Basal inferior and basal inferior septum. So they're here? Refusion also. And there? Not that you agree with that. OK. <laughs> All right, anything else? Apical. Apical? We agree. <coughs> yeah. That apex doesn't seem to be moving. I don't know if it has less perfusion. We could argue about that. <laughs> Because I could say this is attenuation. This is more attenuation from being closer to the transducer, OK? But anyway, it would be a nice case if I wanted to sell perfusion on you guys. But uh, anyway, yeah, the inferior wall here and the apex. So that would suggest uh, at least you know, RCA and LAD. Now, let's say this guy c came in with chest pain. Let's, get the e let's say the ear dog ordered an echo. You did the echo right at the ear. Is this acute ischemia? or a previous MI, right? We don't know that. And of course, how will we find out? Well, we have multiple ways of finding out, right? We do them every day. You can do a stress echo, a nuclear perfusion. You can do a CMR looking for scar. You can do a CTA going straight to the coronaries with CTA or, or, or cath. That won't tell you if what you're seeing is an, is an acute event or old. That would only tell you what the coronaries are like. But you could do a, mo a modality of these things here. Today, we're concentrating on stress echo. So the next half of the talk will be now applying the concepts we just did, looked at at rest, but during stress. And you all have seen this slide 100 times or more. What happens when you go into a stressed uh, uh, test of some kind and you are increasing the demands for uh, myocardial flow, uh, the first thing that happens, of course, there's a flow heterogeneity. Some regions are going to get more flow than others. And that's what spec PET can do, or myocardial perfusion by CMR. You can have this without any ischemia. So when we in the nuclear business say ischemia in the, we are overstretching ourselves. Because there might be ischemia, but there might not. All we're saying is that there is a flow heterogeneity. There are some areas with less flow than others. Patient may be smiling, the wall motion might be perfect, or may not. That's one thing to remember. You know, we overuse the term ischemia because it's convenient, it's easy to say in a report. But what you really are picking up is <coughs> flow heterogeneity. Now, if that becomes really bad, you get regional dysfunction. And that's where echo, CMR come in. Um, and then eventually you may get ECG changes and chest pain. I mean, that's a typical cascade that we all have taught medical students. So stress echo basically is putting stress and then seeing how that ventricle responds. In this case, you see a beautiful normal heart, improves the ejection fraction. Normally, you like to see an EF go by five points or better. Um, if you have a flat EF response without any one motion abnormalities, you scratch your head. 
That's always a problem. When the EF goes up and the ventricle looks great, normal stress cycle. When the EF doesn't do so good and there's a clear cut one motion normalities, you're in good shape. When the EF doesn't get better and there is no regional one motion, that is a little bit of a problem. That could be still be ischemia, or it could be the ventricle responding to other factors like afterload and whatnot. So locally, we don't see that that often. A flat EF is not seen that often without regional one motion anomalies. It can be seen, but not that often. <coughs> so any one motion anomalies here? Is this, a, is this normal? A, global dysfunction. B, regional dysfunction. C, what do you all think? Came in with chest pain, you're getting this equa rest. What about one of our sonographers wanted to take a crack? Anyone? <coughs> what do you think? You're doing the echo. Is this a normal ventricle? No opinions? So much experience here, nobody has an opinion? What do you think, Misha? <coughs> For my eye, imperial lateral wall looks a little bit hypochromatic compared to the. Okay, what about the F? The F? Well, in the mid 50s. I don't know. Man? Huh? 30. It's not normal, right? Yeah. Okay. So we have an EF that is not normal, and then we can say, okay, well, gee, maybe we have some abnormalities. Uh, I could say, well, gee, maybe that apex is not so hot. Uh, maybe this is not so hot, okay? Now, I'm fooling with you guys because this is not a resting echo. But it could have been. It could have been. We see this all the time. People that look like this, you know, little off in the F, and then you start saying, okay, you know. Damn it, awesome. But this is not a resting echo. These are four images after exercise. So here's the whole story. Hopefully. Okay, so now you see the rest next to the post. And now you can see that at rest, everything looked really good. And that, um, you know, you have a very nice reduction in systolic <laughs> cavity, very good EF. You can see it here, you can see it there. And now side by side, wow. Woo. Look at how that cavity at systolic increases in size. Look at that, compared to that. Okay, so you're already seeing the first tips on how to read stress echo. Look for ansystolic dilation, regional or global, or both, and then look for geometric distortion. Those are the two things that your eyes have to be trained to. Now, this is so impressive that of course, you're going to start thinking of multivessel disease, right? because it's really a very impressive uh, abnormality, which the patient did have. So um, ischemia is transient. It can be systolic and diastolic, but we don't do much with diastole. However, uh, it may last minutes or hours, depending on how much stunning you got with the ischemia. And that's, where the, that's how, why we can do a treadmill stress echo because we're basically hoping that we induced enough ischemia to give us two minutes of imaging. That's the reason behind being able to do a treadmill stress echo, which we do a lot. So with exercise, you can do treadmills or bike. We, we'll go over all of them. Pharmacologic, nowadays, the butamine has won the war. Almost no one is doing dipyridamones anymore. But importantly, for either one of them, you can use an atropine. You can do an adjunct. You can do some atropine, even with exercise. There's some people that have done that. Um, you can do hand grip with any. You can do hand grip in a treadmill. You can do hand grip with a dobutamine. You know. So these are adjuncts that can put a little extra stress on the heart, either by doing a hand grip or by putting a little atropine to get that heart rate higher up. Rarely do anybody does it with exercise, but there are people who do. I mean, you're in the treadmill, you haven't reached max, throw a little atropine, get them there. You know, you need to have an IV, and obviously many people don't like to do that because in a regular lab, if you're doing a plain treadmill echo, you don't want to be having an IV. But there, you know, all of those things are permissible. There's no rules against them. 
So with the post treadmill, the biggest advantage, of course, is that um, is you use standardized protocols, Bruce protocol most of the time. Uh, you get additional information, ST changes on the EKG, exercise duration, symptoms during distress. It's very available. Everybody has a treadmill. But this is the most difficult of all the modalities for sonographers. This is not where you put your junior sonographer on day three in the echo lab because it requires the highest degree of expertise of a sonographer. Um, importantly, my ischemia may recover before you got that picture. And that's why you are fighting, battling against the clock. You need to complete your four views, hopefully within 90 minutes, uh, 90 seconds, better within 60 seconds. And by the time you get to two, two and a half, you could be having problems. And you only have two stages, rest and exercise, and rest and post. You don't have anything else. All right, however, having said that, this was a pivotal study, uh, which I can say humbly because it was. It, it was the first time that there were a large number of patients, 255 patients, done simultaneously. Same treadmill, not two treadmills, same exercise. Patient got in the treadmill, there was an echo done before, immediately after, thallium was injected at the very end of the stress, and after the stress echo, they went to the camera and they got the nuclear. So there was no arguments about having two separate exercises for everything. And we got a very, very good uh, concordance. And the other thing that was fascinating was that most discrepancies, about 80% of these discrepancies, were a true positive because everybody had coronary angiograms. Those were the days that you, know, you were doing a lot of diagnostic coronary angiograms. About 80% of these discrepancies were true positives, where one test missed it and the other one did not. Um, but there was no predilection. No one won that battle. It was almost a split between the two. Sometimes one did it, sometimes the other one did it. Years later, as more reports came out, um, a, this um, uh, me meta-analysis was done with uh, over 3,000 patients showing again very, very similar sensitivities of the two tests. Uh, by now, many of the nuclears were done with cestamibi. And a trend towards a better specificity by uh, stress echo. This all came from what you would expect, academic labs. I can tell you, because I have been around for a while, even though I don't look it, <laughs> that in, in the street, as we call this, in the street, the specificity of both are lousy. It's a real problem. In the street, people overcall both, the nuclear and the echo. In academic institution with expertise, yeah, there is a tendency for the stress echo to be a little, but you know, reality is that both suffer from issues, issues of specificity. All right. Now, again, I like to spend time on this because uh, if you learn nothing more, I want you to, to remember this. The practical tips, okay? And systolic cavity size. So look at the apical four chamber, okay? Rest and stress. Whoops. Uh, Okay, so um, rest and stress, and see how small this area a is at end systole. Now, 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 and look at it here. Now, now, now. So there is end systolic regional dilation here. Okay, at the base maybe not so much. Go to two chamber. Now, 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 now. Look at it now. So there's been regional dilation. even more prominent here. Look at how that looks at N-systole compared to the year. And look at the short axis. Now, now, look at here, now, okay? So always pay attention to N-systolic regional dilation 
compared to your baseline, okay? And then, if there is geometric distortion, great. I mean, you can see that there is some geometric distortion at n systole, there is some geometric distortion. They go hand in hand, right? If the n systolic region gets more dilated, it's going to distort geometry, okay? But before your eye goes to geometry, look at size. It's very, very helpful. And then, after you've done that, then look at work thickness, uh, work thickening, okay? Which once you do that, you see that these areas are thickening much less than these areas here. And as we said earlier, the other advantage of an exercise treadmill is that you also get the data from exercise. You can apply your Duke treadmill score in addition to the imaging. And this is not my opinion. This was proven. And this is a study that was published back in 2003. And you all can see that when we applied a, what we call a risk index, which incorporated the wall motion score, the ST changes, and how long the patient stayed on the treadmill, we get this three-dimensional plot where we could much better estimate the risk of events in five years, which makes a lot of sense. This also comes from that same study that we did earlier. We followed the patient for a few years, and about five or six years later, we reported on the actual prognosis of those patients. And you can see again that stress echo and nuclear came out hand in hand in terms of um, assessing uh, prognosis. So bike, we probably should do more bikes for two reasons. They're a lot easier on the sonographers. You're not struggling as much. You're sitting there nicely and patient is exercising. Okay, stay a little longer, bam, bam, you get your pictures. Number one. Number two, you get multiple stages. So now you might be able to see what's happened and you may be able to see that there is an improvement with lower levels of exercise followed by a worsening when ischemia occurs. So what do you all think of this? Is this a normal bike or an abnormal bike? The peak is abnormal. Hmm? The peak is abnormal. Yeah. Why? What do you see abnormal? What is your eye catching? If, you know, before you tell, you see, you're, you're going to regions. You have not listened to anything that I said. Yeah, I tend to do that. Yeah. You were sleeping through the entire lecture. What should your eye be seeing first? The intersolic volume or intersolic <laughs> has increased compared to the pre pre previous uh, stages. So here you are in systolic cavity here, <laughs> and here's here. So you have N systolic cavity dilation. What else have I done here? If you, if you notice, I did not compare this image with that. I compare it with this, right? You compare with the best contraction you get, which was low levels of exercise because the heart actually got better. You can see a very nice EF here, but now we, ha we have a superb EF here. So these two, this is still much better. So when you make this comparison, your eye goes, oh boy, something happened there. If you do this comparison, you might pick it up, but may not be so dramatic. See, this would be your treadmill. That's all you have with your treadmill. This is the bike. Now you look at that. Okay, look at that versus this. And what we have here is a very large area of the, now we can go into regional contraction, okay? And this septum is contracting really well compared to here, where this whole area here is the one that is struggling. And this patient had a very large uh, circumflex lesion. And when we did that comparison, in this case, we had to do two stresses <laughs> because it would not be possible. So the same patients, 100 people were going to CAR. And before CAR, they all did a treadmill echo, and they came the next day and did a bike echo. And then they went to the CAR study. So we could see that they're really very comparable, okay, very comparable. Um, a trend towards a little better sensitivity uh, overall, 82 versus 75, but you know, statistically, none of those things were that dramatic. Multivessel 
88 versus 81. Specificity, maybe treadmill was better, but again, there was nothing. So the point is, they were very comparable. And this is the paper that <coughs> found that in a treadmill, you want to hit 85% or better predicted heart rate, right? We all push patients to get to that 85%. On the bike, heart rate doesn't count because they all have slower heart rates. What counts is the? The double product rate pressure, yeah, rate pressure, which should be more than? 20,000. 20, ah, oh, okay. This, gee, this, you can, yeah, I listen sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So on the bike, you want to get to a double product of heart rate times systolic blood pressure of at least 20K, you know, or better. Okay, that's the magic number on the bike. All right. It's easier on sonographers. You can also, oh, by the way, look at that study function. Look at peer pressures. Um, so you get a very complete study. And therefore, I think we really should be doing more bikes. Anyway, dobutamine, the one I, the one I dislike the most. So dobutamine, uh, there are two ways of capturing and presenting the images. Uh, the one on the right, on the right is, we don't do here, is to do a rest, one low dose, the peak, and then post for recovery. The one we do here more often is rest, two levels of low dose, and peak. Why? Because we get a fair amount of patients that have resting wall motion problems, and with two levels of, um, two levels of low dose, you can better assess contractile reserve and viability. So for that reason, we have used the approach on the right. Neither one is right or, or wrong. Both are approaches used by many labs at their convenience. So, hopefully nobody here says that this is normal. Again, cavity size, right? There versus there. So we have regional dilation at the apex, clear cut, abnormal dobutamine. And again, notice the, how dramatic it is when we compare this way. So just like with bike, with dobutamine, you want to compare the images at peak with one low stress, not, for, not with resting. Same thing here, okay? This one has a little bit of more of a global type of phenomenon, but notice how the cavity here at N-systole, now, 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 and look at it there, now, now, now. Look at the here, short axis. Short axis are really good. Now, 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 let me see if I can catch it. Compared to that. Look at that NC store here. So this is more global. We'll, this patient, I'm going to show this patient later for another reason, okay? But should, everybody here should see that this is abnormal. And obviously, the EF has to have dropped. So the EF went up and then went down. Very important because you know what? Look at this versus this. No dramatic difference, right? That versus that, maybe a little bit, but not dramatic. Versus this, wow. Or versus that, very dramatic. So with bike and dobutamine, compare with a low stress, not with the baseline, because it may return to baseline because of the ischemia or whatever else is going on. So the butamine, you get multiple imaging states, just like you do with a bike. Uh, you can time the ischemia a little better, just like you do with a bike. It's also very easy. This is probably the easiest, because the patient is doing nothing, lying there, and you're taking pictures. So this is your level one. This is where you introduce a sonographer to stress echo with the butamine. And then you move them up the ladder from the butamine to bike to treadmill. This is the best for low EF, no question about it. When you have some, somebody with low EF, they're doing viability, all the data has been done most reliable with dobutamine. It's less sensitive than exercise, particularly if you don't get that magic heart rate of 85% or more. And if you have 
a concentric LVH, the test sucks. There's no other way of saying it. It's a bad test. It's a bad waste of money and putting patients at risk. Should not be done. Anytime you do as uh, somebody orders a dobutamine, you do the resting, you find concentric LVH, you guys should stop, call the attending, and change the test. Because chances are very high you're wasting dollars. Because it's very hard to look at wall motion when you have a small cavity. I'm talking about the, you know, the small cavity thick ventricles, the real, real McCoy. It's very hard. You're going to go from an EF of 70 to an EF of 75. Everything's going to look small. Everything's going to be confusing. You're not going to be able to pick up anything. Okay? It's a bad test. Okay. Actually, it's, it's not the exam reason, but for a small part with thick ventricle, perfusion imaging also is less sensitive. Yeah. So you won't be able to yeah. pick It's up. better than the butamine, but you're right. It's less sensitive too, because you have a very high mass of myocardium. Exactly. What, what would you recommend? Go to straight to CTA or go? Yeah, treat them, treat them like a left bundle. Yeah. I, you know what? I, I think I agree with you 100%. And of course, you get arrhythmias. You know, PVCs, SVTs, 1% atrial fib, and forget about EKG. <laughs> if you get ST, ST depression with dobutamine, that guy is sick. It's very insensitive for some reason. <laughs> don't ask me. I don't know why. But his EKG is very insensitive. Okay, so in summary, we should try to do exercise as much as possible. Use the butamine for those who cannot exercise and for um, patients with low EF. And of course, the good news is that all of these stress echoes are very appropriately recommended. Uh, if you put stress echo with nuclear, they're side by side. They have exactly the same appropriateness recommendations. So they are very appropriate tests, and they're frequently um, recommended. Limitations, we have, we have mentioned them. I'm just putting them again. And of course, uh, I show you a lot of contrast because contrast work. This is part of a study we were doing, and this is without contrast. And if you are astute and have a lot of experience and you follow my rules, you can see that this end systolic cavity is very small here and it's bigger there. But it doesn't come out and jump you in the eye. However, it does here, which you saw this earlier. This is the same case I showed you. Here, <coughs> even, doctor, even man can pick it up. <laughs> here, you might, but it takes a lot more subtleness to go to say, oh wow, look at how small that cavity is and look how bigger it, it became. And here, forget it, it's, forget it. I, don't, I can't see anything here. To be honest, in the two chamber, I'm lost, totally lost. Now look at it here. Look at it, uh, how, how good it looks. And that's what 108 patients showed uh, in a study that was done that has been quoted many times, is that whenever you have more than two segments that you cannot see, contrast then is worth paying $100 for because you do increase significantly the accuracy of the technique. And then comes strain, right? And strain comes from first studies that were done during PCI, PCI. And they showed that when they expanded the balloon, as you expect, strain went down and then recovered. No surprise there. And that took people into, okay, let's try in different situations. There, there had not been that many studies, but this one is one of the early ones, 2009, 100 patients. And again, they showed that the uh, strain dropped and then recovered compared to the non-ischemic uh, regions. So this is addressed, low dose, pre-peak, peak dose. So remember that this is getting better and then getting worse because it's negative. So it gets better, gets worse. Uh, you know, but look at this, okay? So they ended up in their, in their hands with a very good sensitivity and specificity. Personally, I don't buy it. Uh, and very, very competitive with the wall motion, with the eyeball, with the eyeball. Okay, now, this next study, this is the study that I would have liked to have done. So here you have a beautiful dobutamine. You have, um, you can see clearly that it's abnormal with an LAD lesion. And this is a study that I, I wish we, we had done. 
okay? They had a good sample size. They had three experts and two fellows. And each of them had to do a subjective assessment and then process the strain. And you can see that in this, this example, the bull size, they all look very similar with all of them. You know, there's no drum. Maybe this one here is a little different. Uh, but, you know, most of them were relatively in the same ballpark. But here's the bottom line. Very interesting. And not surprising from everything I have told you. So you look at sensitivity, at three experts, two fellows, they're hovering in the 60s, high 70s, okay? By the eye, okay? By strain, many of them, three of them, were in the high 80s. And the guy that was at, the white, the guy that was at 63 moved up to 78. This one did not do much. And this one all had quite an improvement. Everything I have shown you predicts these results. Likewise, look what happened to specificity. You know, except for this guy here. Mm -hmm. They were all in the 60s and 70s. And look what happened here. 40s, 50, low 50s, 22, 13. Bottom line, accuracy 62 versus 48. All for specificity. So, you know, strain can be a very helpful tool during stress echo, but we have to keep it in back of mind we may be too sensitive. And that's, that's the problem that I don't know how we are today going to solve that. And of course, we cannot use contrast. So um, stress echo is inexpensive, it's easy. We need a lot of skills, both on the sonographers and the readers. And uh, strain imaging may be helpful, but again, big issue is the specificity. So we have about a five minutes. I'd like to show you a few cases. I'm not going to ask you questions. I'm just going to point out some things because they're important. This is an old case. When you get um, after exercise, you have to pick up. You know, you guys, I don't know, if you guys sit in the room, you see that sonographers after they do have the stress echo, then they review the images and they select the ones that they're going to present. So these are four post-exercise four chambers, okay? Well, which one would you select? Here you have an EF of 80%. Here you have an EF, an EF of maybe 65. Here you have, I don't know, maybe 35. Here you have maybe 30. So what's going on? First of all, which one would you select? The best or the worst? Well, if the EKG has not changed, which I'm not showing you, but if the EKG is nice, normal sinus rhythm, and there is no problem that you capture the T wave, none of those things, then you should always go for the worst, right? not for the best. Because what's happening here is the same problem we talked about two months ago, foreshortening. So when you foreshorten, the cavities get small, and they all can look much better. This one is important, OK? So is this a normal stress echo or a normal stress echo? OK, first question. Is that the butamy? What do you think, Pasha? Is this normal or abnormal? Okay, where? Wh which segment? It's in the, uh, there's some dyskinesis in the septum. And the cavity looks. Uh, I'm sorry, which septum? Like in the mid intro septum. I would assume that's a four chamber view. Yeah, it's a four chamber. In the mid inferior septum. Okay. All right. So. Is that what you're concerned with? You know, the distal, the mid to distal segments not being normal? Okay. All right. This happens more often than you think, and it's a source of false positives. Now, watch this real well, okay? I'm going to point out. Now, now, now. When is that happening? Is that happening in systole or in early diastole? Early diastole. That's right. Early diastole. And that has a name. It was described many years ago, and it's called incoordinate relaxation. It's a phenomenon where the distal segments start relaxing a little sooner than the other ones. And you get this little funny movement. 
and is diastolic and is not a sign of ischemia. And you have to always be very careful when you watch and you time it real well. As you know, in DG view, you can move your line and you can fit, put it right out in systole and only play systole. And suddenly this go away, disappears. Because it's not a systolic event. So I wanted to show that because that's an important one. What about this one? Man, what do you think of this one? It's normal or abnormal? Quickly. You have everything there, parasternals and uh, apical ones. I mean, if I can add in the, at peak, the systolic volume is pretty <coughs> small, so I think it's normal. Okay. Um, All right, everybody agrees? Anyone, everyone, anyone want to dispute? Or everybody agrees that these are normal as they go? How about the same thing? Okay, so no question that when we look at, uh, let, me, let me do this here, because uh, that way we can point out better. When we look at this, that asystolic volume looks really nice and small compared to there, right? Okay, this is treadmill, by the way. I'm sorry, treadmill. Resting right after. I should have said that at the beginning, I'm sorry. Resting, post. This is not the butamine or, okay. All right, it's a treadmill. So I give you a second, a second look at it because it is simply a baseline and a, and a post, okay? And we agree, this is very small and hyperdynamic compared to this, okay? Here we say, gee, I don't know, maybe it looks about the same. Here we say, I don't know, maybe a little better. So, you know, maybe you're right, maybe it's normal. What about here? Yeah, How does, does this ensystolic cavity right here yeah. looks compared to here? Yeah, I thought this was the tent. Yeah, I mean, the, the cavity looks much larger. Mm -hmm. And then the anterolateral wall motion is probably It's, it's hard to put them together because of the heart rate. But you can see how small that is. And let me see if I can do it for this one. And you can see that one there. OK? So what the Look at the EKGs. Nice, nice, no problem, no arrhythmia, no PVC. Why in the hell is this ensystolic regional area here bigger? And the others don't show that. What's wrong? OK? I will show you what's wrong. Look at the clock and the heart rate. 136 bit per minute, 20 seconds after exercise. 108 heart rate. Um, uh, what was it here? Yeah, a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, here. Uh, 1 minute, 20, 20 seconds. 1 minute, 29 seconds. Heart rate. Uh, heart rate 63, um, two minutes after exercise. Sorry. I should have showed this one first because now they, they, I don't see much sonographers here. Yeah. This is what happens if you wait too long. This is why you're fighting against the clock. And this is one reason why, you know, maybe bicycle might be a little better, okay? This is an inferior ischemia. I'm not going to, guys, uh, you know, I think it's a nice case of inferior is ischemia. But also it has one more thing. This segment is thickening. It's thickening, but when? Now. Now, yeah. So this is what we call post-systolic thickening. If you see post-systolic thickening with a stress echo, almost 99% of the time it is ischemia. If you see it at rest, also, it should be a tip off that there is a problem. Because post historic thickening is always an issue. This one is an example of what we showed you earlier. Again, notice aren't systole, cavity right there, 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 versus here, here, and watch this area here. So we have regional dilation right here and a little geometric distortion because of a circumflex lesion. Circumflex, by the way, are the, are the most difficult to detect. 
LAD is the easiest, followed by RCA and circumflex last. We saw this case before when I was giving you the tips, the, the, the tips, okay? And the question here now, is it normal or normal? Well, we already, we already decided that it was not normal. But is it diffuse or regional? To my eyes, it looks very diffuse. I cannot see that one segment is really winning the battle any better than another segment. But the whole ventricle is bigger than in systole, and of course the EF has dropped, particularly from low dose to peak dose. Why? And we get this periodically. And this is where you have to look at the entire picture, because this is either a multivessel disease or a cardiomyopathy response <coughs> in response to some very high afterload. So sometimes these patients, you know, we get a 230, 240 blood pressure, and we get a very high afterload, and then you get an afterload response where the ventricle drops because of the high afterload. Or they may have some cardiomyopathic problems. I mean, that's why stress echo always, you know, it's always a little less uh, than, than let's say all the techniques because you can, you can pick up myocardial abnormalities that are not due to obstructive disease. Same thing with perfusion. Same thing with perfusion. Yeah. This one is the same. This guy basically had rapid AFib with severe hypertension during the, uh, during the stress echo and, and the ventricle goes to hell. Look at that. Goes to hell. But it was because of a co combination of very rapid heart rate with very high blood pressure. And we can skip this. Um, this. I just had a few slides on viability, uh, which just basically, uh, we do less of this now because honestly, CMR is such a good technique. But remember that contractile reserve is the most sensitive of all when you do the butamine, but it's only about two thirds specific. If you get a biphasic response, i.e. I got better and then worse, it's less sensitive but now you pick up a lot more specificity. That's, that's just the, and, and, and what's the gold standard? Recovery of function after revascularization. That's, that's the gold standard. That, that's what you're going after. You're going after predicting recovery of function. And this is a very nice study done in 2000 where we incorporated all of the dobutamine findings in addition to preservation of wall thickness at rest. So just having preserved wall thickness was extremely sensitive but only 50% specific, specific. And in fact, this and thallium were about the same. These were neck on neck with a regular uh, perfusion study, resting with a resting perfusion study. Um, if you combine them together, you got the best combination is you had a positive dobutamine for viability and also the segments were, were uh, preserving thickness. You got the best, the best combination of results. Um, but importantly, and this is very important because it has been shown by every modality that has looked at viability, is that whenever you have roughly between 20 and 25% of your ventricle viable, you get a much better chance of improving EF. So what you have here is the EF change after revascularization uh, versus number of viable segments. So the more viable segments, the more the improvement in EF with the magic number being at about 25%. This was thallium, this was dobutamine, same patients. And, and that now I think with nuclear, uh, you guys are seeing something similar, that there's a threshold that you need to pump that EF up. Uh, I don't know if it's 25%, but there, there's a threshold, you, you may know it better than I. Is that three, three out of 17? Yeah, so three out of 17, that would be 20%. 20 or something, yeah. <laughs> but it makes sense, obviously. You're gonna have a little area that, is, is, that, that gets better, that you're going to have a global improvement. And I think we can stop at, at this point here because um, I think we've covered most of the points that I wanted to bring home with you. And again, the most important points I wanted to discuss were those practical tips of how to look at regional one motion, both at rest and with exercise. Questions? Good. Let's go and look at echoes.